we are well into the fifth week of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And you know what? If you look at the front, if you look at the front today, I have the map of the front line with me and you will see it on the screen also. See it carefully. This hasn't changed for the past 10 days or so. If at all, there's been a little bit of progress by the Russians, that is too little, too small to be to feature or to be noticed on a map this size. Maybe a military size map, you will see some advances here and there because they are making some advances here and there, particularly in the Mariupol, Nikolaev region. But yet, even the city of Mariupol is still being contested. Most of it has been laid waste. It is still being contested. On the other hand, when you go further, when you go further sort of west, then you can see closer to Kiev, actually Ukrainian armed forces have carried out some counterattacks and recovered some areas. Again, not major areas, but some of the suburbs of Kiev, in fact, they've pushed in some areas Russian forces up to 35 kilometers away from Kiev. So certainly in those areas, Kiev, Kharkiv, the big urban areas, Russians have made no progress. In fact, if you look at the overall situation, it does look like a stalemate has now been reached. The forces are where they, where they are. The lines, the dividing lines between the two sets of forces have not particularly shifted. If you see the last week's average, I would say that they are stationary. Now, this is, this is a very interesting phase in a war, not in a battle, in a war. In the sense that if you have a stalemate on all the fronts, and it's a very wide front as you can see on this map, then you would say that the attacker has been stalemated. And I use my words very carefully. The war has come to its stalemate, but the initiative was with the attacker. The attacker is the one who started the war. So if the attacker has been stalemated, then that means the attacker is not winning. Now, in the middle of this, we've some in, seen some interesting things happen and interesting signals have emerged. And I will talk about those. But before that, I would comment to you an article by Colonel Vivek Chadda. He's a veteran of the Indian Armed Forces. He's a thinking soldier. So he's a research fellow at the Manohar Parikar Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis, IDSA. He wrote a wonderful piece for the print last week, where he taught us the difference between what we generally might call symmetric warfare, asymmetric warfare, but he's taken it one step beyond that. He's saying between finite warfare and infinite warfare. So finite warfare is what the Russians are waging, which means they came in with regular forces, with lots of armor, lots of missiles, lots of air power, artillery, what have you, the whole works, pura bandobast leke. Full Samagri. So they came in with an objective. An objective as they came in was the demilitarization and denazification, as they called it, of Ukraine. That, you know, you translate it any which way, this would mean a regime change in Ukraine. Whether or not they meant it uh, is besides the point. Whether or not they said it is of no consequence. When you say that the current regime in Ukraine is militaristic, it's also neo-Nazi and you want to denazify and demilitarize it. This only means that you want a regime change. So they came in and for that regime change, either they would have had to secure an early surrender with their own version of shock and awe, or they would have to go and dislodge the Zelensky government. On the other hand, while Ukrainian armed forces have suffered damage, but they've continued fighting. So even in Mariupol, and see the visuals of Mariupol, we spoke about it in detail last week. If even in that city, in that port city, Russians haven't got control yet, that means Ukrainians are willing to fight everywhere. So the Russian objectives are finite. Basically, they wanted to change the government and they wanted to make Ukraine dependent on their security or beholden to them to keep to not interfere with them or not to molest them, which means I will not join NATO, I will not join any European alliance, I will reduce the size of my military to one-fifth, that's been Russian demand, and then I'll be a good bacha from then on. So anything I want, I look at Russia, some other, other country threatens me, I will again ask Russia, a bit like Belarus. That 
Ukraine has not submitted to being. In fact, if anything, Ukraine has become more firm and the global support, particularly Western support around U U Ukraine has become much, much, much stronger now. So if that was the objective, and it looks like that was the objective for Russia, that objective has not been achieved. So finite war has, once you say this is my objective and you haven't achieved that, that objective, then not winning a war is like losing a war. I say this carefully, but this is Colonel Chadda's analysis. Then what is Ukraine doing? Ukraine's response to this finite war from the Russians is infinite war, which means I can continue fighting, right? I will not concede defeat anywhere. Even if you take a city, I'll keep fighting from within it. War will never end. So for, for the side, which is usually conventionally the weaker side, the infinite war means that the war will continue for a long time. And if the war continues, as long as the war continues, that side is actually winning because that side did not have a finite objective. And that what seems to be, ha to be ha happening in Ukraine right now. So read this article. I have only summarized it for you and given you some examples and some explanations. Now, just make a comparison. Think about the 1971 India-Pakistan war. India liberated Bangladesh within 13 days. And on that day, Mrs. Gandhi offered a ceasefire and said, our objectives are achieved. We are now happy to stop the war, which means that was our finite objective. Indian army won the war because they achieved that finite objective. If on the other hand, she had said, no, but I will now fight in West Pakistan and I will try to dismember West Pakistan also, chances are she would have got stuck there because it's possible that West Pakistan with a strong army, with a lot of good weaponry, would have, would have then waged a war with infinite objectivity. So finite war versus infinite war. I'm just using that as a very simple example. Now, Russians in this situation, what do they do? Now, I had tweeted about a week or 10 days back that Putin is caught in a situation where it's evident that he cannot win this war. Because there is no way until Zelensky runs away or is assassinated or kidnapped, which will have its own consequences, by the way. And unless somehow the Ukrainian will completely breaks. And so far, you haven't seen any sign of that. There is no way Ukraine will crumble or, U or Ukraine will capitulate. Nor would its Western friends and patrons let that happen now. In that situation, what does Putin do? Because he can't win this war. But at the same time, he can't afford to be seen losing this war. Because see the history of Russia, and I don't go back a thousand years, but see the history of Russia over the last, say, 150 years or so. Russia doesn't really have peaceful transitions. Russia, Russia does not have a democracy. Russia, Russians have not got used to a democracy of any kind. They don't even have peaceful transitions. Usually transitions happen because of internal palace coups or purges and things like that. So whether you check out Stalin, Khrushchev, before that, the Tsar went out violently. So Russia is used to changes like that. So someone like Putin will also have to worry about what's happening with his own palace. And we've seen some advisors and others get impatient. One has also, a couple have also left Russia. So those are things that he has to worry about. So he has the compulsion to somehow declare victory. Now, we've seen two things happen. These are straws in the wind. They can be wrong also, but we can only look at the straws in the wind and analyze them for you. I'm not taking bets on anybody, nor should you, at least not following my advice on anything, because I'm giving you no advice. I'm just giving you the facts as they exist. So first of all, there was a statement that Putin issued. This was on the Russian National Guard Day. National Guard is like say CRPF, a bit like that, Russian National Guard Day, or what is called the Rosguardia. There he said he complimented the Russian troops for carrying out this special military operation, quote unquote, on the territory of Donbass. So in that statement, he did not say on the territory of Ukraine. So that was immediately seen as maybe an indication from him that he's now messaging that he's confining his objectives and his fighting and his operation only to the Donbass region, which is the Luhansk 
and Donetsk region that, that we keep describing to you again and again. That is the region in which a large Russian speaking population lives. That's also a region which Ukrainians call separatist regions where they say there are separatist forces who are basically Russian speakers. One in five Ukrainians, remember, is of Russian origin and a large number of them are in these districts or these regions. So his message only talked about Donbass. It did not talk about all of Ukraine. Now, see, you might say that oh, it's just one message from him to one, one organization and we might be over reading this. It is possible. You can always over read these signals. You can also under read them, but you can also over read these signals. But you have to see it with other evidence. So on Friday last week, uh, that is just before this weekend, Friday last week, this Russian defense ministry at the topmost level carried out a briefing. And at this briefing, they said, and, and I shared with you a story from Reuters and also from Al Jazeera talking about that briefing by the Russian defense ministry at the highest level. In that briefing, they said that the first phase is over. Second phase has now begun and that will focus on the east. Now, what does it mean? When they say first phase is over, interpretation is it means that we have now gone deep enough in the Donbass region. Second phase, your immediate response might be, or oh, second phase means now we'll go and conquer Kharkiv and Dnipro and Kiev. In fact, the interpretation of this briefing is, and in fact, the clarity in this briefing is there, that that is not the target that Russian army is talking about. They are saying the second phase is, the first phase included, the first phase involved not just pushing into the Donbass region, but also neutralizing Ukrainian military power. So taking out Ukrainian military infrastructure wherever, wherever it exists, fuel dumps, missile dumps, ammunition dumps, and also degrading the ability of the Ukrainian forces. Also, the briefer, and I will give you his name, the briefer goes on to say that our concern was that if we just confine our operations to Donbass region, then Ukraine will be able to bring in troops from all over the country to vein on the battles in the Donbass region. That's why we had to create a threat to Kyiv, Kharkiv, Dnipro, even Lviv. So Ukraine will have to divide up its forces and those scattered forces would not be able to block us or block our progress in the Donbass region. That seems to be analysis. In fact, there is a quote from Colonel General Sergei Rutskoy. And what is Colonel General? What rank is Colonel General in the Russian army? Colonel General is a rank between, say, three-star and four-star officers. A little above Lieutenant General because there is a Lieutenant General below it in the Russian army. That Lieutenant General carries two stars on the shoulders. This Colonel General carries three stars but is above Lieutenant General. So a bit like a general, right? It's a, it, it's a rank that is peculiar to some of these armies. I think the North Koreans also have it. Some of the others used to have it. It also comes from a peculiarity in the Russian armed forces structure where the rank of brigadier or brigadier general was abolished as far back as in 1798. So rank structure is a big, bit different. But basically, colonel general is a very senior officer in the Russian hierarchy above Lieutenant General. So this is Colonel General Sergei Rudskoy, who is the head of Russian general staff of the main operations directorate. So a key voice, not just a spokesperson. In this briefing, he said, quote, the combat potential of the armed forces of Ukraine has been considerably reduced, which makes it possible for us to focus our core efforts on achieving the main goal, the liberation of Donbass. Now, you may say that this is shifting of the goalposts. That is to say, okay, I've got Donbass, I am de declaring victory, or I never wanted to take Kiev and Kharkiv, right? Uh, the other side might say it's sour grapes, you always had Donbass in your reach. So, this is a situation where it's possible. I don't know if it will happen but where it's possible that both sides can declare victory. Now, behind this, some other interesting stuff is going on. First of all, there was there were some statements by the Turkish government, also by Turkish President Erdogan. And first of all, you know, hats off to Erdogan because he is selling weapons to Ukraine, including Bayraktar drones, which are slowing down the Russians and inflicting heavy damage onto them. At the same time, 
he is helping the russians and ukrainians negotiate with each other also in his territory in turkey so two rounds or three rounds have taken place already and another round is taking place today and yet another one on the 30th with the delegations of ukraine and russia meeting and at the same time he has thrown an inv invitation to russian oligarchs who are fleeing russia to come and settle down in turkey so he's got his bread buttered on all sides or, or what we might call in hindi dasongliyan ghee mein aur sir kadhai mein right so he is playing all sides beautifully and super skillfully of course these are these are processes that are going on but you have a situation where it would be possible conceivably for both sides to declare victory for russians by saying that look we only wanted donbas and to protect the russian speaking people so we've got it for ukrainians saying dekha donbas they already had in control we haven't let them come beyond that and they haven't broken our will and they've been defeated but you know what in any such warfare once again the best examples are the examples that we are, we are most familiar with 1965 india pakistan war who won it now i have always said that india did not and i say this carefully india did not win the 1965 war but pakistan lost that war now what does that mean that means that only one side had an, had an objective in that war pakistan started the war they had an objective in that war they thought at that time after 11 years of being armed by the americans and others as, as, as members of cto baghdad pact etc an indian army still being punch drunk from 1962 and recovering and rebuilding this was their best opportunity to force a military solution on kashmir that means that is grabbing kashmir by force they started the war they had the objective they had the initiative they failed to achieve any of that india did not have any object, objective in the war except to deny pakistan its objective to that extent because it failed to achieve anything pakistan lost that war i say india did not win that war because india's objective was limited now ukraine could say the same thing that look russians had an objective they wanted to capture our country change our regime but that hasn't happened so these comparisons just make it easier or simpler for us to understand which is the whole idea behind cut the clutter now in the middle of all this because you know this is like one of those tamashas one of those, those gold mouth millies you see a hockey match where ball is somewhere there and everybody is throwing their sticks at it after a while people don't even know where the ball is and suddenly either it slips through and goes goes into the goal or goes out so that kind of a situation is happening with the with ukraine as well in the middle of all this while the two armies are stalemated by ukrainians have succeeded in stalemating the russians russians are taking heavy losses and heavy damages in fact if if i see the russian armed forces briefings and russian defense forces briefings these look like two armies of sort of symmetrical size and ability of fighting because they say today we destroyed so many planes two helicopters so many unmanned vehicles which means drones etc etc so this kind of bean counting is going on this is like a battle or a war between two equals so russian defense forces briefings are not as if they are winning they are just saying we are inflicting losses in the middle of all this when you think that stalemate could be a route to peace and a settlement with both declaring victory joe biden has come in and he in fact has done the equivalent of what the americans call jumping the shark which means he gave quite an inspired speech all that's fine he said what's happening in mariupol people are being denied even safe corridor to escape civilians and russians are killing them it looks like a science fiction movie so all the rest he says in the speech is regular stuff but it's only in the end when he speaks at one line which we are now being told the world is now being told was not in his script where he says for god's sake this man can't be in power and now the white house and state department are trying to say he didn't mean that putin can't be in power in moscow what he means is this man can't be in power over ukraine or his neighbors and all like that now you will have to be very trusting you will have to be somebody's mom to believe this from your son right nobody who's who's running a country and nobody who's running a country the size of russia is going to be fooled by this this he actually he actually set the bar at another level where i'm i'll be surprised 
if Ukrainians want it to be said. Because this almost sounds like a call to say, I shall find Putin to the last Ukrainian. Because if he really wants a regime change in Russia, he wants Putin out, then he has to risk his own troops and risk his own economy and risk a third world war. Otherwise, to leave it to poor little Ukraine, which is already being pummeled from all sides, to say that, look, you are there, I will keep giving you these missiles and weapons. You fight on for as long as it takes to bring down this fellow Vladimir Putin. That, I think, is taking things too far.